Um, welcome to New College Franklin. I'm Henry Hafner. I'm the Director of Student Affairs here. And uh, we're pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Mansfield, a noted author, speaker, and uh, all around the speaker. And uh, <laughs> you didn't come here, you listened to me talk, so I'm uh, going to give it away. How many of you are students at the school? How many of you pay for students at the school? <laughs> <laughs> the rest are just visitors. That's great. It's good to be here. Um, I want to dive right in. Dr. George has asked me to speak about Lincoln. Is that your idea? Uh, actually, I think it was a discussion with Henry and, okay. and a couple of others. But uh, you, you can talk about anything you want. Really? <laughs> Except me. No, I'd like to talk about Lincoln a little bit, and, but really, uh, I'm not going to talk about Lincoln. I'm going to talk about history and historical memory and the battle for memory in our uh, in our time. Uh, unless you are, you know, in living on Mars, you know that Lincoln's gotten a lot of attention recently. And um, I happened, just happened, it was an accident that I wrote a book. Uh, that came out the same day as the Spielberg film. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> you know, these things happen, God's providence. And uh, so it's been very, very interesting to be in the middle of all that and to be uh, talking about Lincoln and the unique way that I wrote about him um, during this time when he's been, been uh, considered in the film and, of course, the Doris Kearns Goodwin book and so on. But let me, let me start by telling you about uh, a football game that I, a uh, Super Bowl that I watched once. Um, when I was about Oh, three years of Christian, still in Christian college. Uh, we were watching the Super Bowl, a whole bunch of us at a big party. And uh, maybe you guys have done this too. It was about the time that it became, we became aware that there were actually Christian athletes, that there were actually guys who might be born again playing on the field of the Super Bowl, uh, you know, playing on the field there. So here we went, three years old, in the Lord, all excited about Jesus, you know, just going to Christian school, everything's a little bit overheated. So we'd be, I think he's a Christian. Number 12, he's a Christian. I know he is. Then he would fumble. Then I can't be a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the camera would be tied on the guy when he would mouth the F word. We could tell, even though they didn't have, you know, mouth and so on. And, okay, you know, he's definitely not a believer. And before long, we had chosen and unchosen almost everybody on the field. <laughs> and our hope that somebody who was a good player was actually a believer. We had no idea what we were talking about. But this was in the era when you were trying to figure out, you know, are there any leading Christians out there? So, you know, who are the heroes, so to speak? You know, of course, there were bigger, better people than that, but being ex-jocks, we were kind of excited about that. Approximately the same thing happened, as Dr. George has probably taught you many times, um, during the 1970s. Um, we've been having kind of a secularizing trend in America, um, and, and as you know, of course, the court cases, Emerson case in 47, Roe v. Wade, all the cases that I'm sure you've studied, you know, from Castle v. Watkins and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, the other cases in the early 60s, prayer case, and so on. And by the 1970s, you know, we, we sort of started to come around, I'm talking about at the popular level as Christians, to the idea that, that some of the founding fathers were actually believers, uh, and a lot of what we been taught in school was wrong. And, um, there were a number of people talking about this, D.J. Kennedy was talking about this, you know, already been talking about this quite some time. A man by the name of Peter Marshall, the son of a Senate chaplain, and that was called the Light and Glory, and that really uh, galvanized that perspective. And so it became a, a sort of a whole part of a game of who, who was a Christian. I think he was. He was he the one that he was. No, he was a deist. No, really, that, that, that's that whole sector that they all say they're deists. No, 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 they're not deists. And so you go through all the leading people in our country, and they were either born again or they were pagans. And before long, you began to realize that, that we, were, we were doing a very black and white kind of thing that has continued to happen uh, in our society. And so the writing of history from a Christian perspective, of course, those of the school, you already know this, because Dr. George and I share this perspective. The writing of history from a Christian perspective um, became a lot, at least, at least biography became a lot, uh, in some of the more preacher, if I can say that without sounding insult, I don't mean to be, <coughs> sort of the preaching history kinds of books became about defending certain figures as Christians or assailing them as nasty pagans rather than, uh, I'm going to sound real kind of new agey murky here, uh, letting the journey speak for itself. Does that make sense? 
if, if we don't if we didn't if we don't know let's say we don't know that would be, that would have been a great solution but instead um, we would offer an upper state and then somebody would come along and hammer us us being Bible believing Christians looking at history because we'd overstated you know uh, you don't have to have Benjamin Franklin as a born again believer to have a Christian heritage in this country, right? So we don't have to have a big fight about Benjamin Franklin. You, you see what I'm talking about? But we'd have books that would go both ways. Well, one of the one of the leaders, one of the people that was the most controversial in this was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Tolstoy had said that he was a miniature Christ. Um, Lincoln's secretary said he was the greatest man since Jesus Christ. And one guy actually said he was the greatest man since Jesus Christ, or maybe greater. Which, you know, I think the guy died instantly when he wrote that. But, <laughs> and so, um, then on the other, other side, most scholars would say that Lincoln is a thoroughgoing atheist and had no genuine faith. And so, well, so the reason that I wrote the book I wrote, I'm not here talking about mainly about the book, I'm talk, here to talk about Lincoln a bit and, and sort of the process of writing history, which I think is a critical part of our sort of battle for memory in this culture. Um, I think that, that the reason I wrote, wrote Lincoln is that I really thought uh, that the journey was the issue. I'm an evangelical believer, absolutely believe in being born again. I pastored. Uh, I went to a Christian college. You know, I mean, I, 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 I've got all that background. At the same time, I write history to try to articulate certain things to the broader culture. Yeah, I want to speak to the body of Christ. Yes, I want to state some Christian distinctives. But a lot of what I'm trying to do is write something that's credible outside of the four walls of the church, so to speak, so that there's a, an appeal and a common ground built with the non-believing world. In my case, specifically, um, not so much intellectuals, but certainly the non-believing Christian press, members of the press, and probably political world. Political leaders. So Lincoln's one of those figures that um, people argue about a great deal. Now I'm not so much talking about the whole issue of Southern heritage and civil war and uh, and so on because I'm I'm not with Mr. Lincoln on almost you know everything about states' rights and so on. But but just speaking about his journey of faith, um, the, the issue for me became that I realized that his journey was so textured and so. Uh, went through so many phases that people were always locking him into one phase or another. Um, scholars did it worst of all. There's no question, and I'll go through it just a moment, that Abraham Lincoln was, for uh, quite a while in his life, maybe as much as a decade, an atheist. Or at least was talking like he was an atheist. We'll talk about maybe why he was saying that later. Um, and so scholars would lock him into that period. Well, then there was a progression. There's no question there was a progression. And, of course, you eventually get to a faith that's at least defined by the, by the second inaugural, at least defined by some of his great speeches. So how did Lincoln make that progression? And could we write history as Christians in a, in a, in a deft enough fashion, in a gentle enough fashion, in a uh, textured enough fashion that we could capture the progression of a man whose assassination may have ended his journey of faith prematurely, so to speak, any assassination in his life prematurely. So, You'll know, excuse me, I'm taking some medication that just gives me constant, almost constant count now, so I'll be drinking some water while we're talking. So, what I wanted to do was to write a Christian history that didn't conclude that one of the greatest Americans was actually, that I actually could prove he was born again. You know? I mean, George is one of my best friends. I can't prove he's born again. You know what I'm saying? You can't prove that I'm born again. So, I'm certainly not going to do it with a man who's been dead for 150 years. Um, but I, but I did think that we could describe a journey and phases and the times and a, and a man's uh, sufferings and difficulties in a way that would capture people, particularly in this generation, particularly in, in the generation that I'm looking at, the faces I'm looking at in the back. Because I'm, I'm convinced that our, this younger generation likes it raw, uh, likes it real, and can learn from the journey even if that journey is not complete. So it's okay with me to describe a man whose journey was, from a born-again perspective, from, a, from an evangelical perspective, perhaps incomplete, and still have God read through those details. In fact, um, one of the things that I said in the book that has caused a little controversy 
um, and it was not intentional on my part, and I'll, and I'll start in with Lincoln's story just a bit, um, was where I sort of rebuked this view of history that I've just, just told you about. And I say basically, hope that water doesn't pour over on me. Um, what has usually discredited, and I'm, I'm talking about Christian efforts in history, is that Lincoln's religious life is seldom allowed to speak for itself. Instead, it becomes the repository of religious agendas. You know that kind of history. This began immediately after his death, and he was killed on Good Friday and at the end of a war that was as much moral crusade as any in history, transformed him in, mystery, in, in memory. In fact, it transformed him by the dawn of the Easter Sunday morning two days after his death. He became no longer slain president, but crucified martyr, even crucified savior. Nearly every Christian denomination has claimed him for their own, as have people of religious persuasions as varied as spiritualists, Hindus, and Jews. The book, the book Claiming Lincoln as a Hindu is a real interesting reading. Um, each persuasion finds in Lincoln a reflection of itself. Each seeks to explain his greatness as a product of its own beliefs. History cannot, should not be treated in such a way. Those who believe in a sovereign God who, who rules history should be humble enough before the face of their creator to report the past as it was, no matter how disturbing, and to always understand themselves as feeling their way along the contours of providence. And I think that phrase is important. I, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm going to put it on my I'm, I'm print t-shirts and stuff, contours of providence. <laughs> because, because if we believe in providence, then we believe that all lives are providentially determined, no matter what they become, whether they fit our preferences, our wishes, our hopes, or not. Abraham Lincoln died before he made a born-again declaration, before his faith was fully developed as we might wish it to be, then that's part of providence too, and we should honor God by simply describing what happened in his, in his sovereign rulership over the world and not try to make it um, comply with our own rulership in the world, or our own wishes to rule the world. So we should be humble enough before the face of their, uh, their creator to report the past as it was, no matter how disturbing, and to always understand themselves as feeling their way along the contours of history. To invent, to contort history to neatly packaged spiritual lessons does disservice to the very idea of God's sovereignty. So uh, what, I, what I wanted to do was two or three things. I wanted to describe the journey wherever it went. I wanted to reach to a generation that likes learning from the journey and doesn't need things neatly packaged. Um, and, and then I wanted, quite frankly, to hopefully write something that would be respected in the Lincoln scholarly community. That was, that was also written by a guy who's pretty well known to be an evangelical. Uh, pr that's proving that, that being born again is not a brain bypass. Which <laughs> 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 we seem to constantly have to affirm again and again. So let me, let me just take you for a moment a little bit through the Lincoln journey. Uh, I really would like to take questions more than anything else because I love doing that. I think we get down to what you're interested in. And, um, and then and let me draw some conclusions at the end. How many of you have seen the movie? I might have seen you throw it on the corner. Oh, you you seen see the Lincoln movie? Okay. There's, if you have paid attention to Lincoln at all, at all in your life and have heard the typical textbook you know, versions of the end of his life, then you have probably heard something like this, that Mary and Abraham had kind of a warm, romantic, flirty carriage ride the last day of his life that they went to Ford's Theater that night, that she was hanging on him, that she said, what will Miss uh, Harris think of me hanging on to you? So this is the other the girl and the other young couple they were sort of dating with. Um, and, uh, and Lincoln said, wow, she will think nothing of it at all. And that was the last thing he ever said. Almost me, almost worthless, husband, wife, chit chat. Well, but that's probably not true. It's the version you hear all the time but it's probably not true. Mary Todd Lincoln said, not long after Lincoln died, uh, was killed, and others uh, sort of confirmed that this was what was going on, the driver of the buggy that day, and some people who were near the, 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 the box that night at Forest Theater, that this is what actually happened. That in that afternoon carriage ride, and you saw it in the film, although it's misquoted, in that afternoon carriage ride, Mary Todd Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln were riding along, and they were feeling pretty good. It was a warm spring day, the war is pretty much, it's, it's obvious it's coming to a conclusion. They've had a lot of grief. They lost a son while they were in the White House. Of course, the, the war itself, difficult time. You know, family strive. I, I, I hope that some of you know that Mary Todd Lincoln actually had 
relatives fighting for the Confederacy. I mean, it was a, they, were, they were really fighting these things out even in the White House. And so that afternoon, they did have a conversation about what would go on after the war. And Abraham was saying things approximately like, well, we won't go back to Springfield. We will, you know, we'll, we'll go to Europe, we'll rest, we'll, et cetera. That conversation got interrupted. They, went home, they had to go home. They had to have dinner. They had, he had some meetings. So they went to Ford's Theater that night, and they resumed the conversation. Now, according to Mary Todd Lincoln, and it's, it's very well substantiated, although you've, you've never heard it before, and they tried to quote it in the film, but they got it wrong. Um, according to, to uh, Mary Todd Lincoln and some others, he says to her in the booth that night that we won't go abroad, we won't go to Springfield, we'll go abroad, we will visit the Holy Land, he says. The Holy Land, hmm. And uh, then after a few minutes, John Wilkes Booth is already in the, in the box as he's saying this. We will visit the Holy Land and see those places hallowed by the footsteps of the Savior. And then the, just before the Derringer ball cracks into his, into his skull, uh, he says, there is no place I so desire to see as Jerusalem. Now, does that mean he's born again? No. Uh, does it mean there's something going on that scholars haven't described to us and that somehow the versions that we've heard have been a little <coughs> jaundiced? Yes, it does mean they're flawed. In the film, uh, written and produced by two Jewish men who are known for doing really uh, positive and powerful portrayals of Christianity, by the way, so I don't, I'm not alleging any bias. You saw Amistad, also by Spielberg, one of the finest portrayals of the Christian faith on, on film uh, is in that movie done by Spielberg. But I spent some time with Mr. Kushner, uh, who was the script writer, and I've never met Mr. Spielberg, but in their version, all that conversation happens in the buggy that afternoon, and Lincoln says, I should very much not like to walk in the footsteps of the Savior, but like to see the city of Solomon and David. So I saw the film uh, at, a, at a screenwriter's thing, and wrote Kushner, whom I had only met the day before, and said, what the heck? You know, I was kind of messing with it because I had a little time with it, and we had some fun, so I'm, my approach is always to you know, slap people around. And so, <laughs> What's up with you? We, we had just had a conversation about the fact that, you know, you wanted to be faithful to what had happened and Lincoln's spiritual journey. I said, well, you've turned him into, you know, a member of the synagogue down the street. Obviously, he, he, we had talked that way the day before. Don't think I'm being rude. This was the tone of our chat the day before. He said, yeah, it got changed. He didn't even know how. He was the scriptwriter. So somehow we went from, I'd like to walk in the footsteps of the Savior, as Lincoln's possibly among the last 20 words he ever said, to not the last few words he ever said, and instead, I'd like to go see the city of Solomon and David. Hmm. So the film missed a grand opportunity, but the good thing is there's only one source even for that conversation, and it's the one I'm quoting that, that, that says, footsteps of the Savior. Any historian who says that there is a conversation on that last day that has to do with where they'll go after the war and whether they'll go to the Holy Land is quoting from that interview in which it's very clear, in which Mary Lincoln and some others add in later and say, no question, he was talking about going to the Holy Land. He wanted to walk in the footsteps of the Savior. He wanted to go to Jerusalem. So what does that mean? It means that, not, my point is not just kind of a narrow, well, they lied to us on yet another issue of history. That's pretty easy. We could, we can do talks about that for 10 years. That doesn't really help us. The real issue is, that there's a, there's a journey in Lincoln's life from where I'm about to start you and scan very quickly to, to that moment. And that moment, if those words are remotely true, is even beyond the faith we see reflected in the Second Inaugural Address, which is arguably the greatest you know, political sermon in American history, one of them anyway. So what was this journey? What was this, this progression that is, that is so unusual that hardly anybody gets it right and, and you've probably never read anything of what I've just said in any textbook or even, even college, uh, you know, extra reading that you've had to do. Here's the, here's, the, here's the sort of the progression, and it's so much the American journey. Uh, Lincoln's life, I think, and, and when it comes to his religion, is so much a uh, reflection of the American journey, uh, or at least a lot of people's individual journeys within the American context, that it's, it's very revealing. So Lincoln, you know, is born in the early 1800s, as you know, and there are two factors that shaped his early faith. Part of it is that in the early 1800s, most of you know the Second Great Awakening is taking place. The Second Great Awakening is, a, is a, in one sense, a wonderful series of revivals, renewals, bringing us back from the devastations of the Revolution, uh, when faith is just decimated. Pastors killed, Bible, Bibles burned, churches turned into houses of prostitution or 
riding stables or what have you by the British. So after the American Revolution, uh, there's, there's, there's this desperate sense that uh, think something's being lost, a heritage is being lost, which is always a sentiment in American history and often true. Um, the revivals are wonderful times of renewal. Uh, Jonathan Edwards' grandson, Timothy Dwight, leads great, you know, great return, so to speak, at Yale, etc. But as they move to the frontier, these revivals, and as they are less well-led or led by people who are not perhaps as learned, perhaps as schooled, perhaps as ethical, in some cases, you have pretty wild, you know, barking, rolling on the ground, doctrinally in error kinds of things happening occasionally. Even if they're doctrinally solid, they are, um, you know, beyond anything that you've seen with Biddy Hinn on TV, or beyond anything, you know, beyond what your exposure is, but beyond the extreme edge of the charismaniac movement, and I speak as a card-carrying uh, charismaniac. Uh, so, all that to say, very extreme. Well, here's Abraham Lincoln, he's growing up in that context. He's growing up in a context of these very overheated revivals. On top of that, his father is the kind of man, he's a man we hear described a lot by people who are artists and actors and musicians, uh, at least in my experience, a man who's uh, tearfully, sentimentally religious, and then could be unbelievably abusive. So he'd be crying about Jesus at dinner and beating his son by, by bedtime. We've, we've heard that kind of story before in the lives of people, Marilyn Manson and others who you know, turn from faith. So this turned Lincoln early from the revivals, from church. He had, he had early in his life, I think, some sense of a, a God and some sense of the, the, the beauty and the power of scripture. When they wouldn't go to church, he'd gather the kid, kid, or when his parents would go to church, he'd gather the kids in the, in the cabins nearby. They'd have a little church service, and he would lead singing and preach. People don't often talk about that when he was 9, 10 years old. So there's an early kind of a double whammy turning Lincoln from uh, the church, from revivals, from what passes for religion in his community, which is almost all Second Great Awakening revival type movements. The thing that really seals that turning, that uh, rejection of faith, that, that, that abhorrence of his father's brand and the revival brand of faith, is the, the thing that one, is one of the things that we most honor Lincoln for, most remember him positively for, and that's his great experiment in self-education. You know, the whole issue of walking five miles to borrow a book and reading voraciously and so on, and, and becoming an exceptional, exceptional man to the power of, of, uh, of his own self-education. The problem is that when, often when you're self-educated, you have nobody guiding your reading choices. You have nobody guiding your, your philosophy. And so, sure, he's reading Shakespeare, but he's also reading Thomas Paine, you know, The Age of Reason. Yes, he's reading, you know, whomever, you know, Parson Weems, but he's all, and, you know, on, on Washington and so on. Uh, but, he's, but he's also reading uh, Gibbons' Decline and Fall, or Robert Burns' more acidic poetry, or anti-Christian poetry, and so on. So you, you have him absorbing a lot of the skepticism of the age. You have him uh, absorbing a lot of the, the anti-Christian thinking of the sort of new enlightenment movement that was happening early in the 1800s. And that's what sticks for quite some time, as he steps into manhood at the age of 21, leaves his father's house. Legally, he's bound off for his father's service until he's 21 years old. He goes and lives in a place, a uh, village called New Salem. He's without question a village atheist, no question about it. He would carry a Bible around just to criticize it. He would use the bad word for Jesus being illegitimate. Um, he would uh, criticize scripture he had learned, all the little tricks of showing how scripture supposedly contradicted itself, all the things that you, you hear now from Dawkins and the boys, you know, um, you know uh, Christopher Hitchens and all of you believe it now. But, uh, but yeah, Christopher Hitchens and all of them. So, so now, you know, that's, that's where he is. And he's, he, I mean, he's vehement. He's vehement. At one point, he actually writes a little Thomas Paine, Age of Reason kind of booklet. And some of his friends, who are aware that he's got political aspirations, realize this, is, this will kill any chances he has of ever running for office. And so they snap one guy snatches it and throws it in the fire. Uh, right, just snatches it out of Lincoln's hand and throws it in the fire. Lincoln gets furious, one account says he takes a swing at the guy. Um, of course, they're good friends for life, so that, that got healed up. But all that to say, this is how far along he was. Now, a couple other factors are working in here. One of them is, you have to understand that Lincoln, when I say he suffered from depression, I don't mean he had a few dark days. He suffered from what was unquestionably, I think by anyone's 
any expert's definition, clinical depression. Lincoln um, endured a great many deaths in his life, and this worked a darkness into his soul that was pretty astonishing. His mother, um, it was said that she was beclouded by a spirit of darkness. That's a quote from Herndon. Um, Lincoln lost a brother when he was three. Uh, he would have been too young probably to digest the experience, but he would have felt the, what was going on in the house. His mother died when he was nine. He, had to, he helped make the casket and bury the woman, can you imagine? He lost his sister when he was 16. He lost the first woman, and some say the only woman he ever loved. That's one of the kind of romantic backstories in the Lincoln life, but he loved, you know, Anne Hutchinson and Anne Hutchinson, I bet that wrong. Anyway, I'll come back to that in a minute. It's not Anne Hutchinson. She was on like the Mayflower or something. I'm only 100 years off. <laughs> I'll come back to Anne Rutledge. There we go. Um, and she, she died. I, you know, Lincoln said many times in his life he was haunted by the sound of rain, or the thought of rain falling on graves. The horrible depressions. And not just sort of on having a bad day. His friends had to go on suicide watch. They had to lock him in his room, take away razors. This happened more than once. Um, <clears throat> by one account, a couple of accounts that happened the day he was supposed to be meeting Mary Todd Lincoln uh, to marry her. So that doesn't go very well. He's off trying to kill himself while she's standing at the altar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> James Dobson marriage to forming right there. <laughs> and she was a certifiable woman too. We'll come back to that. Um, she was a little shy. I don't mean to be well. I am. Um, she, was, she was nuts. And so. That's the sort of trouble thing that's going on. And so Lincoln suffers really dark, deep darkness. There's a kind of a funny moment in, in the book, and, and of course it comes from the sources, where a little nine-year-old girl has walked up and asked Lincoln just for his autograph in her autograph book. You know, and there's even a description of the shape of her bright sunny dress on and everything. Lincoln takes it and writes this dark poem, you know, you are young, but I am older, you know. And, you still have hope, but I don't, and go die. I mean, it was that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I can read it to you. It's, it's all she did was say, sir, would you sign my book? You know, and he writes this, like, suicide note. In her, in her. <laughs> and that's, I'm not kidding, that's the way it was. He actually wrote poetry. Some of you have read his poetry. It's quite good. And he wrote a poem about killing himself in the woods near his home uh, and, and published it three years to the day um, after Ann Rutledge died. So, leave not the only woman, that's certainly the first woman he ever, he ever loved. So Lincoln's got really dark things happening there. Uh, the suicide, of course, that's connected to the depression. This, this paganism he's been, he's been reading. Um, his, his animosity towards authority figures who are religious. He, he came to it was at a point where he hated pastors and so on. Um, and, and, and then he, you know, Lincoln had one of the most important things about Lincoln's early life that most people miss is that he believed himself cursed. Now this is not something most people talk about, but it's very, very clear in the sources. Herndon talked about it. Herndon is his primary biographer and law, law partner. Talked about it a great deal. Uh, Lincoln be believed, and I'm going to use the, their word for it because it's the only word that really makes sense. Lincoln talked a great deal about his bastardy. That was the word they used to use. His uh, grandmother had been raped. His mother, therefore, was illegitimate. Lincoln had that era's beliefs about you know, the biology, all these biological and primogenitor issues. The first son is morally superior to the second son, and things of that nature. And he believed that God had cursed him because he was the son of an illegitimate woman. Um, he talked about it openly. Um, and many of his friends said, you know, his atheism really wasn't atheism. He wasn't, he wasn't. He wasn't disbelieving, he was mad at God. It's like what Douglas Wilson has said so beautifully in some of his apologetic stuff, and others, of course, have said it too. You know, the atheist says, there is no God, and I hate him. Um, that's, that's very much where Lincoln was. So his friend said, oh, he believed he was just mad. God had rolled him through pain like Job. That's the exact phrase that Herndon used. So you have a man who's intellectually turned towards skepticism, you have a man who suffers from depression, and then all that aside, you've got a man who thinks he's cursed. Legitimately, decades of his life, believes that God has marked him and rejected him. And then, and I'm not just leaning to the unclean to be cool or whatever, I want you to understand that for oh, a couple of decades of his life, Lincoln thought he had syphilis. And that was uh, at the root of a great deal of what was called depression in the 1800s. The great book called Lincoln's Melancholy by um, Joshua... Wolf 
Schenk, S-H-E-N-K. It's brilliant. It's all about his depression and how much syphilis played into depression in that age. Because during his atheist period, he did what men often did on the frontier and uh, may have, we don't have any proof of it, but may have contracted syphilis. So all of that's playing in his mind. Well, what changes? Okay, that's the progression. That's the journey. The man is clearly you know, a, a skeptic of his age. Well, what happens is, first of all, believe it or not, he marries Mary Todd Lincoln, and she's a devoted Episcopalian. So that at least connects him a little bit with the church. That brings him back a little bit towards some connection to the church. But that's not, that's not the big turning. The big turning comes in 1850. Okay? He's, he's softened a little bit. He's, you know, maybe through her eyes, he's the of the church or something. It's, it's certainly no, no big conversion to Jesus at all. But in 1850, two things happen that I think are the beginning of where I can see real providence converging in his life. He's finished, he's left Congress, and his father-in-law has died. Um, he goes to, he's the lawyer in the family, and it's a very contentious family, as you can kind of read in Mary, Mary Todd's personality. And he goes to his father's estate up in Lexington, Kentucky. He's adjudicating all these issues and filing all these papers and trying to untangle this man's tangled affairs. And he takes respite in his father-in-law's library, pulls down off of a shelf a, a book called The Christian's Defense. He starts to read it. For the first time, someone is answering pain point by point as a believer. So someone's answering the event. Someone's giving a rational apologetic. And we're fairly used to that now, but remember, Lincoln's lived almost all his life on the, on the, on the fiery revivalistic frontier. There aren't a lot of, at least he's not aware that there is a lot of literature that's, that's answering this stuff. It's kind of like if you meet a non-believer today and you say, yeah, there are books about Christianity and politics. <laughs> you know, there, there are, there, yeah, there's a thing called a Bible, you know. I mean, I remember the first, one of the first people I led to Jesus didn't know what a Bible really was, didn't know where Genesis was. You know, that kind of just completely, how can you live in America and not know this? Well, this is, this is what was going on as far as apologetics was concerned with Lincoln. He starts to read the book. Well, he reads it for quite some time. He goes back and looks at who the author is. Turns out the author is a Presbyterian pastor in his hometown, Springfield. So here he is in Lexington, Kentucky, reading the best book he's ever written, ever, ever read on Christian apologetics. And the guy lives down the street, quite literally lives down the street. They have to walk by uh, this man's church, First Pres in Springfield, um, to, um, to get to his office from where they live. So... At just as he returns to Springfield, his son becomes ill and has a horrible sickness for almost two months and dies at the age of four. What a horrible kind of sickness of, of what they call consumption. And that's not an accurate medical term, but it, it gives you some sense of what they were experiencing. It was as though the body was being consumed from within. It was a, it was a combination of syndromes. Lincoln, you know, this is the first of deaths within his family, but it's the I mean, within his immediate family, but it's the next in a long series of a, maybe a dozen friends and relatives who have died horribly. He's on the edge anyway. People are talking about him killing himself, friends who knew him. And at that moment, this pastor, uh, of a Reverend Smith, is sent for, comes, and, and this pastor is a, is a man very much like, like what Lincoln was, had been what, what Lincoln was. He too had read The Skeptics. Uh, he too had uh, been, you know, critical and even would go to the revivals on the frontier and laugh and throw things and be drunk and yeah, I can do that too, you know, roll on the ground and mock all the stuff that they were doing. And then he got born again at one of the revival meetings, and that's the way it always works. <laughs> and so radically, like radically born again, and he became a Cumberland Presbyterian, you know, that movement, and then he, then he became, uh, he moved, shifted within his Calvinism and left, left them and went with some other others who were more righteous and holy. Um, <laughs> the, the for righteousness and all that. Um, so, this man is the perfect man to minister to Lincoln. He's outdoorsy, he's big, he's muscular, he's strong, he's smart, he's sarcastic. Lincoln loves this. The fact that the reason this guy didn't win more debates in the eyes of those observing was that he was too crushingly sarcastic with his opponent. He would just crush the man, you know, just continue reaching to his chest and just crush his kids, his wife, his mother, you know. <laughs> Stop on it, spit it, you know, and say curses. And um, Lincoln loved all that, right? Lincoln's, Lincoln's a Robert Burns man. Let's just take everybody on the broke. And this guy had a broke. So all that to say, um, Lincoln identifies with this man, and just at the point when Lincoln 
might very well have killed himself. Death of, his, death of a child, come on. I mean, given all he's been through and how, just even the, I don't mean to make it light, the death of a girlfriend and almost sent him to death's door, how much more the death of a son. So, this is a massive turning point in Lincoln's life. This man ministers to Lincoln. Um, and the, again, maybe it's the province of God, Episcopalian pastor, Episcopal pastor that they would have reached to because Mary went to that church, um, was not in town. So they would reach for the only other pastor they knew, this guy that Lincoln had met, and only as the author of these books. So there's a big debate, as there is in everything in Lincoln's life spiritually, about what exactly that, that happened at that moment. What happened to Lincoln at that moment? Did he get born again? Did he become convinced of Trinitarian Christianity? You have many descriptions of it. I, I think it's pretty obvious that Lincoln makes a turn, certainly completes a progression towards believing in, a, in God and believing in the value and the truth of Scripture and believing in the value and the truth of Christian ministry. A lot of things start changing in his life since we're told to look for fruit. He starts giving money to Christian ministries, so and not just one or two, but about a dozen in the city. Um, he occasionally attends church, but not, not very frequently. Um, he befriends ministers. At some point, a number, number of times, they've got dinner parties at the Lincoln home. There's nobody but preachers in the house. Baptist preachers, Presbyterian men, preachers, etc. Um, he lends his buggy and a horse to the new Baptist minister in Springfield for a year and a half. He's not Baptist. I mean, Lincoln's not. Um, I can go on and on and on and on. I think at that point, Lincoln is a man turned towards God, accepting of the Bible as some form of revelation, some, some, some form of authoritative revelation. Um, but maybe, I, I, don't, I can't say at any point in his life, at this moment he's born again, we know for sure he said so, or pastor said we prayed these words, or what have you. But he's turned, and that's the condition he enters into office. In. Um, it's only a decade later that he enters into the presidency, and that's, that's what you see during that decade of the 50s. You see a Lincoln who believes in God, who's extolling scripture, his train journey, you know, from Springfield to Washington, the famous one where he's hidden away, he makes speeches to legislatures and so on. They are filled with you know, his reliance on God and the God who was, who was there at Valley Forge and may he be with me and all that kind of thing. I don't think I, people are suspicious of Lincoln because he was often cunning, um, but I don't, I, I think that at least the majority of this is heartfelt. Sure, some of it's political stuff. You know, every politician feels the need to make a nod to the great American you know, religious impetus, whether they're personally born again or not. But I think this is, this is some legitimate. Let me cut to the presidency and tell you about the second most important turning point in his life spiritually. Um, when Lincoln enters office, and, and I urge you to read the first and second inaugural addresses of Abraham Lincoln, they're absolutely beautiful. It's astonishing that a man who's largely self educated could write like that. I mean, it's, he wrote all his own speeches, it's unbelievable. But in his first inaugural, you see Lincoln, a believer in God, you see Lincoln a man who's steeped in scripture and the, and the literature of the time, the Christian and sort of Shakespearean literature of the time. But he is still, I mean, we, we might use the word Arminian, I'm not trying to be that theological about it. He believes that events are in human hands. He literally says in his first inaugural to the South, into your hands and not in mine is this issue of civil war. He's, he's, he's like a lot of new, new, new people elected to office. You know, we get elected by telling people, you know, we can control events and I'm the best person to lead you in doing it. And that's all fine until you're actually in office for a while and you realize that events may not be controlled by anybody except God. And that's, that's kind of what Lincoln comes to. Lincoln, in his first inaugural, is a, is a believer in the broad sense, but he's also very much a believer in human control of history. Well, four years goes by, and you know what those four years, four years were like. They were absolutely horrible. And for Lincoln, it's worse than it is um, for perhaps other generals and folks in, in, in the southern states, because Lincoln can't buy a victory. Lincoln loses battles. The North should have won by letting half their troops sleep. You, you, you know what I mean? I mean, the, there, are, there are whole battles won because generals stay too long at coffee. There are, I mean, lost because generals stay too long at coffee. There are battles lost. Um, because a general after Gettysburg says, let them cross the river, we'll get them in the morning. And when they cross the river in the morning, the, the enemy is you know, miles and miles away because they were smart to march all night. Um, Lincoln has, you know, as you see in the film, I think it's beautifully portrayed, you know, walks depressed and exhausted throughout the White, the White House all night. He can't buy a victory. He, it's, a, it's an agonizing thing for him. Um, 
this is when he starts to get sarcastically angry, and he says, if Mr. McClellan, General McClellan's not going to use the army, I would like to borrow it. Um, you know, he's, he's upset, he can't seem to get anything done, and, and in a great uh, little note that he wrote, he often would debate with himself late at night on pieces of paper, uh, he wrote a thing called Meditation on the Divine Will. And he basically said, look, God could end this war, he chooses not to do it. See, he's coming to this belief in a sovereign God. The Lord could end this war, he's just chosen, he's just chosen not to do it. <clears throat> And since he's chosen not to do it, there must be a reason. There must be some offense. There must be some reason he visits this upon us. And this is, this is pretty far down the road, of course, from where he's been. He now sees that God rules in history, and he sees that God actually can visit a war in a nation by way of chastising that nation. This is, this is good biblical theology. Lincoln's acquired it not from, primarily from church, although he attended a church. He's acquired it from his own reading of scripture and books like Reverend Smith's. The second inaugural is what tells the tale. Lincoln uh, is disgusted with the South, disgusted with the need of the, the war, but he does definitely say that this war was visited upon us by God as chastisement, as judgment from God. Um, and people who would have disagreed with him on slavery and states' rights were saying exactly the same thing. The miracle is that Lincoln got there from this, this, this act at just cussing atheist face he was in. So, by the second inaugural, which I'm, I trust you read or you will, he is a man who's perhaps a deeper believer in God in a broad sense. Again, I can never at any point in his life say that he's a born again man, etc. Uh, but I, I, you can definitely see the marks of this progression where he's moved from believing that events are in human hands to believing that uh, there is a God, that God has some deal, some connection of dealings with the nation of uh, the United States, and that God is chastising the United States for its abuse. Of slaves. That's Lincoln's conclusion. Okay, of course, even folks in the North wouldn't agree with that, much less a lot of other folks. But in terms of his progression of faith, that's pretty far down the road. And here's what's interesting. Afterwards, he told a friend uh, who came to visit and congratulated him on the speech. He said that speech is not going to be popular in history, which Lincoln was never right about those things. He thought Gettysburg Address wouldn't be either. Um, he said, you know, this speech is not going to be popular in history. He said, because people do not like being shown the gap. He uses the word the gap. The, you know, the space, not the story. Uh, he uses the, he says the people do not like being shown the gap between themselves and God. And then another time he said it differently, he said people do not like being shown the difference of purpose between themselves and God. So he saw himself as small p prophet articulating to the nation what he believed to be God's will. And that's the state he's in when he's killed having had the conversation that day with his wife in which he said, I want to walk in the footsteps of the Savior. So the safest interpretation for me, the thing that if I'm trying to be a good little historian and, and only look at the evidence, the safest thing for me is to say Lincoln was in progression. There seems to be some almost gossip that he might have been baptized weeks later. He was definitely counseling his ministers. He was definitely deeping in his faith. None of us can judge his heart from this distance. Um, there's no question some kind of a journey of faith that was becoming distinctly Christian, biblical, I would even say progressively evangelical, was ended by John Wilkes Booth on that night. Now, let me just tell you, take five more minutes before I take your questions and say, this has been the most interesting book I've ever written from the standpoint of the response that I've had. I've never had people call me, well-known people call me, invitations to speak at universities uh, of the kind, I have lots of those, but I'm saying I don't, I, of the kind where they ask, and part of the reason is, and a professor did, once said it not being, not, he didn't intend to be as insulting as he was, but I understood what he was trying to say. He said, I, I never expected that one of you people, that's <laughs> number one, don't ever call anybody you people, right? <laughs> one of you people, and I stopped him, I said, you mean Native Americans? I'm from Native Americans. You mean Native Americans? And he starts laughing because I've caught him, right? He doesn't mean Native Americans. He means you thunderheaded, evangelical, empty-headed Christian types. He said, I never thought one of you people could write a book objective about somebody's journey of faith. Now, that doesn't make me any kind of hero, but what I'm saying is, do you see that all I'm trying to do is track the contours of providence, right? All I'm trying to do is what happened, because what happened is what God, I'm not going to get into a theological debate, permitted, ordained, providentially oversaw. I'll leave that to your persuasion, I think you know mine, uh, that God sovereignly ordained these things. So I want I to retell the story that God wrote. That's what I want to tell. Without having a preconceived bias. The, the, the way that has impacted people has been astonishing. 
And a lot of it is that in our generation, people don't want pre-baked conclusions. What they want is an honest journey that they can, they can ponder. So I've had the most unusual conversations as a result of this book. And all I'm doing in the book is trying to faithfully, in my own stumbling way, tell this story with as little bias as I can have. Now, I've got my bias. Everybody's got bias. You don't write, you don't do anything without some degree of bias from your assumption, uh, assumptions, a priori assumptions, as you know. But the fact that, that uh, an evangelical who had written The Faith of George W. Bush or written whatever other books somebody might know me for, leaning hard into objectivity, <coughs> stopping repeatedly saying, it'd be nice to think this is true, we just can't be sure. <coughs> They're stunned. Now, they shouldn't be, because there's you know, far more gifted, intellectual, you know, capable historians who are Christians who have written. These guys just don't know the whole of what we produced. But it, maybe at the popular level, they just haven't had a chance to see this kind of thing. Maybe. And it's, it's, it's been amazing. In fact, very well-known non-Christian radio personalities and TV personalities have pursued me afterwards in the green room or off, off the air more about their personal faith as a result of them reading this book than any book I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And I specifically, we, we specifically baked a presentation of the gospel into the George W. Bush book. We actually found the words that he prayed that perhaps was his first prayer of salvation and put it in the book because I knew the book was going to go to China and I knew the book was going to go to, you know, I, I was hoping maybe if it went anywhere at all it was going to go that way. That's what they were talking about. So I, I was thinking, I'll just lead the whole world revival through a book on George W. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> that shows you how stupid I can be about my publishing life. But all that to say, <laughs> this book has been the one. The, the, the previous one, by the way, was the one I wrote on Guinness. So it's not, the, it's not the big personalities necessarily, it's not the big conclusions of faith, it's not, hey, guess what, George W. Bush is, a, um, is, a, is an evangelical, despite the fact he can't really articulate anything about it publicly. Um, no, it's, it's the faith story of Guinness, it's the faith story of, of Lincoln, which are all a little murky and a little, I mean, they're, they're powerful and moving and inspiring, but they're not, there are clear, clear cut lines, clear conclusions. And I'm not saying that I have a preference for that. You know, I actually prefer the opposite. Hospital corner is very neat things. Are you in or you out? I wish everybody had to, you know, wear some kind of a mark. You're born again. You're not. That'd be so easy. Um, but there's something our generation wants about the journey. I, I know I keep using that word like I've discovered it, but um, the result of uh, the experience that I've had having told this story, which is right there on the page, is actually a kind of bias and bigotry that keeps historians from writing about that. If we have to be bigoted in the other direction not to put it on the page. Um, I think, I think, I think my, my experience really, really shows me something about our, our generation. And um, again, I don't think I've, I've done anything unique except just capture a story that was there to tell. And then you know, my publisher had the smarts to bring it out the day that the Spielberg film came out. But I, I urge you, as we are in a battle for memory in our society, you are in a battle for memory. Who are we? Where have we been? You know, it's the it's the theology of the Lion King. Remember who you are, and, and who are you? And, and if we believe in a sovereign God, we don't have to inflate, distort. We just simply need to know who we are and where we've been. Tell the truth, and and apologize for what you apologize for if, in, in a in a in a sense of reconciliation and healing, but not feel the obligation. To, uh, to lie, exactly. to deceive, to hide. Um, yes, they were Freemasons. For heaven's sakes, let's stop saying they weren't. You know, or that, that, I mean, you know, all of those kinds of standard things some of us have been through by the hour. So there's my little presentation on Lincoln. I'll answer questions until you pull the plug. I guess you, it's your call. So if you have any questions at all, or disagreements, doesn't bother George, you anything you want to round out? Well, before we go to questions, why don't you just give everybody a quick glimpse of your your bibliography. What, what else have you written? I started my life writing all of his books. Uh, the things <laughs> which he I've written some books in this series that George uh, edited all. I think all of you probably know of Leaders in Action, Churchill, Washington, and uh, don't help me. I'll come back in just a minute. Booker T. Washington, Churchill, and Whitfield. 
Um, and it was, they were great experiences. And then George and I teamed up to write the history of religion for Tennessee for the bicentennial. And I also wrote a book called, um, a little, little book that called uh, More Than Dates and Dead People. So that, I had written all that when I was sort of pastor here in town, and George and I, I was just, you know, taking George to lunch, begging him to let me write something else. Um, and then I went through a pretty massive transition in my life, some of you will know about, and I immediately afterwards wrote The Faith of George W. Bush. And that was um, a huge seller. It came at a great time in my life. And the reason it was a big seller really was, uh, I think if there's any gift or art to my publishing life, and it hasn't been mine, it's been on the part of my publishers, it's just hitting the market at the right time with the right book. George W. Bush, you know, you all know, he was, he was a, whatever you may think of him, he was a serious Christian as far as he understood Christianity, and I, I think he was a serious Christian. I think he was well taught by other Christians. He just wasn't able to articulate it. Part of the problem with this whole administration, I think we know, is that you, you, there wasn't a lot of art articulation. So I got a chance to write this book. Uh, I meet with George and said, so I apologize for taking credit for all your books. Please help me. Um, I, we, we got access nobody else had, had gotten only because I'd written this book on Churchill that folks in the Bush administration knew. Um, and then they had used and so on. And so we ended up meeting with his high school teacher that he had never talked to any other author. Uh, we got, you did a great interview with George, uh, I'm sorry, not George, with um, Robinson, James Robinson. He had been in the room at some critical moments. He really hadn't talked to anybody about that before. So we ended up having all kinds of things on the page and then, you know, I could string words together and we got, so I got some other good people. So that book did very, very well. And then a whole bunch of other books came after. I wrote a book called The Faith of the American Soldier. I was embedded with U.S. troops in Iraq for a while. Um, I wrote a book on, um, oh goodness, I've written books on Palin, on Guinness, the Guinness uh, Company. Um, I wrote a book on the faith of Barack Obama, um, just because I needed to be beaten some more uh, in, in public by my friends. Um, sort of. and, uh, and then I, um, I've written, um, you know, a number of other books I've written on Oprah. Um, and I've just had this book come out, this book out of Lincoln since last year. I've just now written a book that's going to be interesting. I'm sure some of you might want to ask me about it if you, if you want to talk about it. I was working on a book called Killing Jesus um, before a dude named O'Reilly um, announced that he was going to do a book on killing Jesus. Now we're both doing a book on killing Jesus. And if we don't kill each other first, there'll be a great ride where the Gospels talked about a great deal. And there's nothing going on behind the scenes but friendship. Um, and I've, the, my favorite book that I've written, other than Lincoln, is one that I'm ed actually editing this week, and it's called Mansfield's Book of Manly Men. It's a lot of fun. It's got Victorian artwork in it, you know, and it's it's just about <coughs> vignettes of men, man, men and manhood. And I can show you the cover. It's a lot of fun. So that's the kind of thing that I do. My biggest books thus far uh, are uh, Lincoln, Obama, which is not on the on the bestseller list here, but three or four European countries. If, you know, if you're on the bestseller list in Ireland, you know, you sold like you know, this many books. International <laughs> 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 uh, And uh, now Lincoln, you know, and now I've written some books now that are evergreen. You understand what I mean? Like the Bush book will die and go away. This will probably be on the shelves when I, you know, hopefully when I am old, older. Um, and it will eventually surpass anything else I've ever done. And at the pace it's going right now, it'll. You know, give it some years, and maybe please God, four or five more Lincoln movies. Um, it'll, <laughs> that's my whole, that's my world. Anything you wanted to drill down into there? Besides you claiming credit for what I've written, like I can do. <laughs> Any questions? On, on, uh, yes, sir. Just as a reminder, Lincoln is all downtown this week. If anybody wants to go. I, I uh, yeah, thank you for saying that. I, you know, I was, had the privilege only because of my wife's connections to go to the premiere in Hollywood and uh, I you know the film is is a it's I'm glad for it because it brings the history to the fore it's definitely a talkie 147 speaking parts the action is like a it's like a word all novel in the sense that the action is only propelled by dialogue in somebody's parlor you know you never nobody ever shoots anything or blows anything up or you know I mean just they're just talking um, and I liked it very much. I mean, it's, it's slanted, it's got its biases, it completely ignores faith, you know. Um, but I, you know, I gotta tell you, I'm so eager to just have a prompt for conversation with people um, that it's, um, it's, I'm willing for a bad movie to be put out on a historical topic that then I can engage in dialogue about. Um, you know, uh, I, I had one 20 minute conversation with Christopher Hitchens in the green room when we were both on a show. 
and I got to share more of the gospel. I mean, I'm, when I say share the gospel, it wasn't like I, you know, brought into the altar, but get more of the gospel shouted into the air over him interrupting because we were arguing about Braveheart. And he hated Braveheart, and he hates Mel Gibson, and he hates all anti-British everything in the whole world. Um, and he was on a stiff whiskey, so I was his target. <laughs> but at least we could have a discussion about something, because I'm not the kind of guy he would normally talk to, you know, just in the green room on a stiff whiskey. So, anyway, that's, that's my little observation about that. I don't, I don't curse these things. I'm thankful to have a chance to have a dialogue. Anything? Any other questions? You might, you might disagree. Come on, you got to disagree with something. How old was Lincoln at that first turning point you described? Well, he was born in what, 1809? So, 1850s, he's 41 years old. Lost a four-year-old son. He would he would lose another in the White House. It's well known. Willie William Wallace Lincoln died uh, in the White House. Um, he had all he had a lot of a lot of suffering in his life, and I think there was a genetic thing. His, his uh, on his father's side, they were literally and legally mental cases, institutionalized mental cases. And on his mother's side, they were poetic depressives, Celtic poetic depressives. You, you understand how, kind of how I mean that? Correct. Kind of, <laughs> kind of that Scottish thing where you can't tell whether they're poetic geniuses or nuts. You know, and, and that's kind of the mother's son. So that converges in. in Another little intriguing thing, and I'll, I, come to you, I, I won't talk away the question time, that I've always liked is that Lincoln's mother was the best wrestler in Kentucky. Um, this is at a time, at a time when men and women wrestled. For, you know, this is part of the evening entertainment. Everybody gets liquored out and they, they wrestle. And um, the way we know this is that one of the later uh, Supreme Court justices in Kentucky said, yeah, she threw me all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a hilarious quote. Yes, I remember what was going on. You know, I remember Mr. Lincoln and the honor to blah, 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 blah. And he says, and, this is, and his mother flipped me not two times. <laughs> How would you describe your primary sources? Would be a good summary. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad. Thank you for saying that because there was one thing I forgot to say in that in that area. I, um, I mean, I can research, but I don't assume that I, um, I don't ever assume I can do research sufficiently on my own. It's not an insecurity. It's just that these are big topics. Lincoln studies is a great, big, contentious, roiling area. So what I do is make a beeline for the Springfield Library, um, and that's a great, big, huge facility. As you know, it's not just a library. It's like, it's like the Disneyland of Lincolnalia with uh, the Library of Congress. It's, that, that'd, be a, that'd be pretty much what it's like. It's amazing you should go. And I got the five or six leading uh, scholars who aren't famous, aren't published. You know, I didn't go get Doris Kearns Good when I went and got the guys there. And I said, I'm going to try to do this. Watch me. Keep your eye on me if you will. I'll be happy to pay you. And don't let me screw up. That's my, that was my quote, being real holy. And, um, and they did. And they, they watched me, and I said, now, I'm going to say this. Do you have a problem with that? And they go, no, no, that's a substantiated quote. Like, like they say, there's no question that this, this uh, interview with Mary Lincoln, um, which describes, like, they say, we don't know why people are ignoring that. That's one of our great frustrations. That's one. Everybody knows about it because that's the only way they know about that last day conversation, but nobody goes the whole distance and says he wanted to walk in the footsteps of the Savior. Mm -hmm. So when I hear that kind of thing from some of the leading scholars in the world, I'm like, well, don't tell anybody until my book comes out. <laughs> I don't have many, like, breakthroughs. That's one of them. So, um, so I, of course, you know, I buy everything, and I digest everything, and I ask people to help me. You know, I, I have a, we actually have a firm that produces books for people and so on, and publishers and what have you. So we've got a, a squad of internet geeks and researchers, and, you know, and then I just, I don't, I don't have any problem. Uh, I'm going to write every word. I don't have any problem hiring a scholar and saying, make me good. I'm not a specialist in Lincoln. I'm not kidding that I am. I'm not a specialist in anything I've written about. I mean, honestly, I'm not a specialist in beer, you know, for heaven's sakes, not George, on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, you understand what I mean. I'm, I'm, I want to learn. I write a good book. I'll do whatever I can to write a good book. I'm not going to let somebody ghost write it for me. I'm not going to let some, I'm not, I'm digesting everything and making it my own. But I, I want to learn this stuff. So. I think one of the appeals, at least in the reviews, of the Lincoln book is that it, it is very well researched. And I did half to three quarters of it, but I didn't do the genius stuff. The genius stuff came from, honest to God, 50 years in scholars that I either, I found out if I could buy them, <laughs> or I took them to lunch, or I did something, I helped me teach me. I don't have any problem with that kind of 
the research process for me is the issue. I know I can write in English, and I can occasionally write a moving sentence. The question is, am I going to know what I'm talking about? Can I break new ground? Can I? And sometimes you're just telling a story that's been told. You're just telling it better than somebody else. Than most, it's usually been told. And sometimes you have a chance to really break something open. And um, you know, I, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to figure out names. I've had conversations with Doris Kearns Goodwin about this book, and she actually said, well, I wish I'd brought more of that to the fore. I think it would have been interesting to the country. You know, I fell to my knees, and angels appeared, and, you know, <laughs> choirs began singing, and my life was over. I was happy. But, um, you know, you're happy when you hear that, because I'm, I'm not a Lincoln scholar. I don't know that at all. So the research phase is really, really important for me, and normally George gets a panicked call about halfway through, oh, my God, what have I done? You know, and then you point in the right direction. But... You know, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I don't know stuff. That's kind of how that works. And then I just get people to teach me. I'll sit all day in, in a Lincoln Scholar's office and say, no, teach me this and tell me that. What, what's that about? How can this guy be so wrong? And what's the bias that's keeping this guy from getting it right? Why do I hate this guy? You know. <laughs> all right, one more real quick. And then I'll go over. Yes, sir. Yeah. Did you come away with the delicate balance of the moral imperative of emancipation as opposed to the preservation of the Union? Um, I, we all know that the emancipation was a, 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 a more measure, half step, more symbolic than anything else. Um, didn't free a lot of slaves, did free some. We're, we're, we're glad for it and its, and its intent. It's probably broke a whole bunch of laws. I think the more important issue for me about it, if I may say it this way, is that it's very, very well substantiated that Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation out of his sense of a covenant with God. Now, I'm not trying to dress Lincoln up and make him more Christian than he is. I'm happy to say he was a stinky pagan and had, didn't, never got close to God. But what had happened was he'd written this meditation on the divine will I'm talking I've told you about during the middle of the war where he had come to the conclusion that God had visited the war on the country. The corollary of that was that God had visited the war in the country because of slavery, he believed. That's what Lincoln believed. And so Lincoln went, said, and, and that we had we have major people sitting in the room at the time he said it, and, and three of them are journaling, Gideon Wells, pretty major people, Sound Chase, I mean pretty major figures in American history, independent of each other, are uh, keeping journals. And Lincoln three weeks after this meditation on divine will goes into his cabinet and says, look, we've been talking for some time about an emancipation proclamation. I'm going to issue it now. Let me tell you why. I've made a covenant with God. I asked him to give us some victories. Um, we've, we've had some, finally, some victories for the union. I see that as God signing off on this covenant, and I'm going to issue the emancipation proclamation. I mean, that's, that's written in three different men's journals, writing independently, and every scholar that I talk to said, oh, no question. I even said to them, why didn't you write it in your leading book on Lincoln? You know? And it's because they don't want to talk about faith. That's just the bottom line. Um, and so that's, that's why. So in, in terms of Lincoln's personal progression, I think that's significant. I think that's genuine. I think it's significant. In fact, the guy said, excuse me, in, in, the, in the meeting, they go, excuse me, sir? Did you say, what did you say? You know? And he said, no, no, you heard me right. I made a covenant with God, and this is what I'm doing. So uh, I, I think the... The Emancipation Proclamation at a crass political level was about re-articulating war aims, redefining the war. Um, I think as a statement of Lincoln's life, I think it was a, as he understood it, a genuine act of faith on his part out of a sense of a covenant with God. What God thought about that, I don't know, but, but it says where Lincoln was um, by January 1, 1863. Okay, I'll be happy to answer other questions. Well, do we have time? I mean, I'll, do we need to go? Uh, you, you decide. Okay. You know the quote Horace Greeley, is that right? The quote Horace Greeley that he supposedly made to Horace Greeley that said um, that his main focus was the union. Do you know uh, his main focus. When, Lincoln, when Lincoln made that comment to Horace Greeley about the union being his main focus? Yeah, I, I would keep slavery if I could. My goal is to preserve the union. Right. Yeah, that's, right. that's valid. Okay. That's a, that is substantial. I mean, again, I'm not. That's according to the the guys who spent their whole lives doing this. Okay. It's not my evaluation. Right. But they, that's that's one of the more one of the debated. But these guys say absolutely substantiated quotes that he okay. he said my goal is to preserve the union. If I could have preserved the union, kept slavery, I would have done it. You know, okay. 
keep the union, get rid of slavery. I don't. That's not my primary thing, and it, and it really wasn't. And I, if I'm reading it right, you know, I think he comes to that at some point. In the words, no question, he's a racist early in his life. No question about it. In fact, he made a couple of racist uh, comments even while he was in the White House. But I think, I think if, if what I'm seeing, what these historians are helping me understand, both in England and here, he's he's coming to an understanding a little bit better. And the other thing too is, we don't under, underestimate. I'm sorry, I've been writing something else all day, and my brain's not. Uh, um, black man, bushy hair, free slave, civil war. The simple ones I forgot. I remember this other um, He had never met a man like that before, and he wrote. He wrote and told a bunch of people. You know, he's really shifted my understanding of what what's potential for a black man. Lincoln's problem, and it's somewhat depicted in the film. He he wanted. He would. He came to a conclusion that free, slaves should be freed. He wasn't sure they were intellectually, genetically, blacks were equal to whites. It, it, probably his whole life he wasn't sure of that. Um, Douglas moved him further towards believing there was something possible down the road. Um, and we don't know much more than that. So I was like, I guess, bless you. It's not your favorite question. <laughs>